we're going to be looking at the book of Jeremiah. And we may even be looking at the book of Job in conjunction with the book of Jeremiah because Jeremiah and Job had quite a bit in common. Both of them got upset at God. Both of them questioned God's justice. And both of them, excuse me just a minute, I got to cut off something here. I got a, one of these sensors, diabetic sensors, and it goes off at the most inopportune time. And so I must silence the alarm. No, in my case, it's when it's rising. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can't get away with a whole lot when these things buzz when you get on. <laughs> but uh, so, so chapter number 15, we uh, began last weekend, and the whole concept there was that Jeremiah was mourning, mourning what was about to happen to Jerusalem and Judah. And uh, he didn't want what was about to happen. He pleaded with them to change their ways and to do what was right. But no, the people were not interested. Now, they had plenty to go on. Uh, about 150 years, about 100 years plus uh, before this particular book, uh, they had seen their brothers and sisters in the north, the ten northern tribes, be demolished and hauled away into captivity by Sennacherib, the Assyrian government. They should have gleaned some type of direction from what happened. You know, we are supposed to learn from the consequences of our era. Uh, that's how we train our minds. Look, the way you learn not to touch a hot stove is when you were a little kid, you accidentally put your hand on the stove and that pretty much trains you <laughs> for the rest of your life. Uh, I, I knew, uh, uh, you know, the way I got trained on not sneaking out at night to go to Panama City Beach was when I came in and my dad happened to be sitting on my bed about two o'clock in the morning. And I was trained, trained by the consequences of my behavior. And so, you know, you could go through all of that. Uh, uh, everything we, we experience is supposed to teach us. And uh, that's even in your diet. You know, uh, you remember the, there's certain things if. If you eat one or two, they're okay, but if you eat a bunch of them, you'll get sick. And uh, what is that, green apples? There's one episode on uh, Andy Griffith where Opie got in the back of a truck and ate uh, about 12 of those green apples, and then he developed, of course, a stomach ache. So you know not to do that kind of stuff. So Jeremiah was trying to, you know, warn the people of Judah, Judah the the, the two southern tribes there, Benjamin and Judah, uh, he was trying to get them to see what the consequences of disobedience to God brought, rejection of his word, refusal to hear. You know, just look at what happened in our history less than 100 years ago, a little more than 100 years ago. And so this is where we're at in chapter number 15. And the Lord, and I'll just highlight the verse that we noticed last week was verse 1. Then the Lord said unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be towards this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. So God told Jeremiah, he's already made up his mind that he's going to, and I'll use these phrases, drop the hammer on them for their disobedience. And he said, even the two great historical intercessors, the people of Israel all knew Samuel and all knew Moses. And they were both known to plead on behalf of the people to God for his forbearance. In both cases, 
uh, God honored Samuel and Moses. Not because of the people, but because of the intercessor, which is, of course, type of Christ interceding. So uh, in this case, the Lord said, I'll just tell you how far they're at and how far they've gone. There's no return now. He said, if the greatest intercessors Israel ever knew came before me, I'm not going to change my mind. <laughs> so this is the burden of Jeremiah. This is the one that we hear uh, and, and uh, realize that he's called the weeping prophet for. And so uh, um, just a sidelight. Uh, my voice is raspy, but not today. The, the reason it's raspy today is because I let a doctor stick a thing in my nose, go all the way down my throat yesterday. <laughs> you tell me, uh, look at your vocal cord. And I said, I don't want to look. That's an ugly sight in there. But uh, anyway, so bear with me. Just, just say, he's just an old goat losing his voice. Just say that. Well, we get all the way over to verse number four, and God said, and I will cause them to be removed from all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. Now, you see God's memory. He never forgot because, see, they never repented. And this has been, the Lord's been warning them even through the prophet Isaiah and uh, Joel and Habakkuk. He had sent them prophet after prophet after prophet and, and they all said, get right with God or else. Turn from these pagan religions, these false deities that you've built shrines right up against the temple. We can't, God says, he said in, in his Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other God before me. You can't worship a God, the Father, and then claim you worship false deities. You can't do it. And so they did. They were warned. And so God said, I'm going to get to them now. We, last week we looked at a passage. Well, hold your place right there and look at Second Chronicles. Let's see what he's talking about. Second Chronicles. What did Manasseh do in Hezekiah? I mean... Must have been pretty bad because the Lord said the reason I'm about to destroy them is because of what they did and caused you to do what you're doing now. Chronicles chapter 32 and uh, I believe verse number 6 through 10. 32, 6 through 10. No, it wasn't. It's 32, it's 33, 6 through 10. Here's what Hezekiah and Manasseh had done. Actually, Manasseh had kind of not followed Hezekiah's footsteps. But he says, and he caused, in verse number six, and he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. So he was, they were sacrificing children in the fire. Now that's what the pagans were doing. Uh, the... Moabites and the Jebusites and the Philistines and the Assyrians. Uh, they literally sacrificed their live children to their gods. The Aztecs were bad about that down here. Uh, the Incas in Peru were known to sacrifice their children. And the Bible calls it the slaughtering of the innocent. And that's why God said, I'm judging you. And he said, I'm not even judging you because of your wickedness and your vile lifestyle. I'm judging you because you have slain the innocent. And they're talking about the babies and the young children. And so he goes on to say, also he observed times. You know, the, the archaeologist read the Babylonian Chronicles. They've had, they've been in the British Museum for a couple hundred years. But recently, a couple of scholars have deciphered what was on those tablets just in the last two weeks. 
and they have reported the Babylonians use the moon and the sun and the stars as their guide for history. They would declare, in one case, they interpreted it as uh, a king will die. And if he dies after this full moon, then the people will be okay. But if he doesn't die, then the people are going to go under. And uh, so all of these things are the enchantments, the witchcraft, the wizardry, which God condemns. All through the Old Testament condemns it. Condemns it in the New Testament. Uh, and certainly in the book of Revelation, he uses the word sorcery as the thing that's going to fall out on their judgment, on life, the humanity's judgment. But here, he said, uh, all of this thing has come upon you uh, because you literally uh, followed these pagan ways. Over and over and over again, he warned them not to do that. Uh, so Second Chronicles 32, 6 says, uh, he used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit. That is, uh, false, uh, false spirits or evil spirits, demons, and, other, and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He set up a carved image. This is what Manasseh did. The idol which he made, where did he set it up? Did he set it up down at the uh, uh, auditorium, the city auditorium? No. Or maybe he set it up on the highway as a icon. No. You know where he set up the worship or the false image that was carved of one of these false did? He put it in the church. <laughs> he set it up in the house of God, of which God had said to David and Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. So what did Manasseh do? Yeah, I'm going to put Baal's name right alongside of it. I'm going to put Asterisk's name right alongside of it. So he violated the Lord and his commandments in every aspect that you could do. You couldn't get more worse. And a hundred plus years later, the Lord brings it up to the people of Judah. I'm fixing to drop the hammer on you. And it started with your king Manasseh. Now, we know the story of Manasseh. Eventually, he saw the error of his ways, and towards the second half of his life, he tried to make amends, and he eventually was carried off into captivity. But he said, uh, uh, Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed that for your father, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinance by the hand of Moses." Now, here's where people say, we don't like that God of the Old Testament. <laughs> well, that, the, the Lord gave them a formula by which they could have successful living. And I say today that although we're not under the law, we're under grace, but there, is a, uh, there are commandments that we're to live by under grace. And that is to, to govern our personal lifestyle. And he, he's very clear all through the New Testament, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, and, and do this, and follow this way. Uh, uh, let the Spirit uh, mortify the deeds of the flesh. Uh, all of the things that uh, we're taught, and it doesn't rob me or you of any fun, it robs us of trouble. <laughs> Not that we're trouble-free, but look, uh, if God says, don't get drunk, and you start getting drunk all the time, where's that going to lead for you? Pretty obvious. If God says, stay away from sorcery, and you get on uh, hallucinogenic drugs, I, where's that going to lead to you? Look, I look out here, and I've mentioned this before, all the homeless we have, they're everywhere. They're They're increasing. And when you see one, and most all of them have, they've lost their, their teeth, which is a sign of methamphetamines. 
I, it's like, do they not, are they to the point they can't realize what it's doing to themselves? I mean, it's, it's, it's destroying the very body they have. And the, they're, they're, the end thereof is the way of death. But see, the way of the world and the philosophy of the pagans is you need to do this stuff because it's the right way. You need to get involved in drugs socially. You need to do this uh, without being uh, a scrooge about it. But the end thereof are the ways of death. So the, the law for the Old Testament Jew was to give them the most successful life they could have. And for the New Testament, the way of Christ is to give us the most successful life we can have. That's, but yet people say, I don't want God telling me what to do. God, I'm not following what God says. I don't want to hear what that old book says. Okay. It's about like it. Have at it. Have at it. And see where it ends up. It won't end pretty. It won't end peaceful. And so here, he said, that's what happened in Manasseh. But look at verse number 9 of Second Chronicles 33. Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err. So God is pointing back to one of their great kings and holding him accountable for leading the people in a way the people should have known not to go anyway. He said, and to do what? Worse than the heathen, whom the Lord hath destroyed before the children of Israel. So the ones God drove out of the promised land that he had given to the children of Israel when they came through the wilderness and God said, I'm, I'm taken to a land that flows with milk and honey and I'm going to give you this land. And God said, I'm going to drive them out. And he did. But now they adopted the pagans that God drove out, their religions. And God says, you ended up doing worse than them. My people turned out to be worse than a wicked sinner. That's pretty heavy indictment. Now that's what we run into back in Jeremiah chapter 15. That's the context of the verse we just read in Jeremiah 15, 4, when God said to them, and I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. So it is important for those who are in leadership in governments to live godly lives. Nobody wants a nation confined to one forced religion. Nobody wants that. And even our founder fa founding fathers were not Baptist or all Methodists. Or, but they all had a compass that honored the book and they believed in the Lord God, the Creator. At, at the least, they believed that. Many of them professed to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. So uh, it's important for a nation that their leadership be what we would term as godly. That doesn't mean they didn't sin. Oh my goodness. Every time you say that to some heathen, they go, well, so-and-so, you know, he was running around with so-and-so. Yeah, yeah we, know he's a, we know that he was a sinner. But he publicly declared his allegiance to the Creator. You say, does that matter? Yeah, it does. We haven't had that. Righteousness exalteth the nation, and sin is a reproach to any people. You see, what happens? People take on the morality of their leaders. And you can know in a 25-year space, 25 or 30-year space of our presidential situation, it started deteriorating, you know, back there when it all hit the roof about the immorality going on in the White House. And pretty soon, the whole population said, if the president can do it, 
We can do it. So now, I don't know. If you look at the situation, the whole situation, I would say we're in a heap of trouble. Uh, Either way around, either way, we're in a heap of trouble. Uh, We don't have uh, righteousness and and morality, biblical morality, uh, in uh, being exalted in the lives of our politicians. And when somebody does speak out for the Lord Jesus, they get blasted. Of course, the fourth wing of government, the media, they, uh, they blast them. You can't, you can't testify or say what you feel. Look at that poor kicker from Kansas City. All he said was a biblical perspective. And boy, they ate him alive. I was glad to see the Kansas City Chiefs uh, re-upped his contract. That was kind of their saying, in your face, which I'm not a big Kansas City Chief fan, but for that reason, I have to at least pull for them a little bit. And so uh, some of these others, they won't stand. They, they turn every way the wind blows. Jeremiah didn't. Verse number five of chapter 15 For who shall have pity upon thee? This is the Lord speaking, O Jerusalem. Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside and ask how thou doest? God is saying, I'm your God, and you've rejected me. Well, let me ask you, of all your pagan nations that you think are cool, this is the way the Europeans do it. We always hear that. Well, the Europeans do this. Okay, okay. Still, look at them compared to us. Uh, you saw that in the Olympics in Paris. They couldn't, they couldn't swim in the river, their main river. They told them it was clean. Then one of the swimmers got sick. And, uh, oh, listen. Now, I, I suspect we'll hear more of that in the coming days. I, I really believe you will. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. But I believe you'll find that there was more picked up in that river than met the eye. So he said right there, the Lord said, nobody's going to come look for you when you're destroyed and you're forsaken. None of your friends, your allies, your so-called allies, they're going to come for you? No. It says in verse number six, thou hast forsaken me. This is the Lord talking to Judah, saith the Lord. Thou art gone backward, therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. And then the Lord said, I am weary with repenting. What he was doing, he was forbearing. God was had in his heart to drop the hammer on him for many, many years. And each time the Lord waited and said, if I could get them, if I could find one righteous. Remember what he did in Sodom and Gomorrah? Abraham said, hey, don't. And God said, if I can find 50 righteous, I'll spare the city. Then it got down to 10 righteous, and he couldn't find 10. And after all that, boom, it all went south. Well, now God is saying, I am tired of forbearing. The book of Romans said, knoweth not that the goodness of God leadeth, should lead thee to repentance, and that, uh, that you experience his forbearance. In other words, he has his plan, but because of his long suffering and his love and his kindness, he withholds it. Every parent who's ever raised a child have had to have forbearance. You should have dropped the hammer months ago, if not years, but you let it go because you were hoping they'd finally see the light and eventually you found out they weren't going to see the light. And depending on what generation live in, uh, when the light finally got turned on, uh, it, it varied from generation to generation for the light to turn on. <laughs> in my case, it was called a whooping. And, <laughs> and uh, you didn't want that. But I, I can remember all the times you got one, you know, parents would say, I have told you over and over and over again. That's called forbearance. And God forbeared 
here and God says, I'm tired of doing that. My patience has run out. And that's what he said right there. He said, and I will fan them in verse seven with a fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy, and notice he says, my people, since they return not from their ways. God didn't call them, I will destroy those evil. He said, they're my people. I mean, they were always his people. That's why it was so offensive that they would not follow him. They belonged to him, and he was offering himself to them. And when they did obey him, everything went good. And then it gets sad. Their widows are increased to me above the sands of the sea. That means their, arm, their soldiers were being killed off. Uh, sad thing when, you know, it gets so innumerable that the dead men in the land uh, are likened to the sands of the sea. I have brought them, I brought upon them against the mother of the young men a spoiler at noonday. So you've got the wives suffering, the mothers suffering. I will, and he goes to say, I have caused him to fall upon it suddenly and terrors upon the city. So when Nebuchadnezzar finally came and destroyed Jerusalem and burned it to the ground. Uh, it happened uh, quickly. Uh, today they had a picture on one of the news services of the walls. They dug down all the way to the wall that was there when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C. And as I've mentioned before, they've they found charred uh, Babylonian uh, spearheads in that wall. And they had extensive walls, but they crumbled. And uh, it's, it's ironic in the day's world that the Lord has allowed uh, more than ever, you know, with the use of technology and drones and satellites, they're, they're really discovering a lot of things. They found and published today some uh, glass lanterns and lamps inside the, the wall of Jerusalem that showed how sudden uh, the destruction was during Nebuchadnezzar's time. The lamps they found were burning when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. They found that this week. They found all kind of stuff uh, in the last 14 days, but they published it this week. And, and all of these, and, and it showed that the people were just living, not expecting anything. And that's why the Lord says it's going to come quickly and suddenly. And, and uh, they didn't, they, see the false prophets were telling them there's not going to be any war. There's not going to be any attack. There's not going to be any famine. Don't let Jeremiah and all his fuddy dud, his Bible thumping preachers, don't let them get you folks upset. They said all is well. Don't worry about it. Everything's wonderful. Everything's uh, beautiful in the neighborhood, you know? Well, it wasn't. And Jeremiah had struggled against these false prophets. Remember, they were all out to get him, and they tried to kill him. And he stood against them, and he goes on in verse number 9 to describe the awful thing that was going to happen there. And she hath borne seven, she that hath borne seven languish this year. Now, here's the thing about the seven. In the Hebrew life, seven children, it was mentioned in the book of Job and also in, I believe, the book of Ruth. Seven was considered a perfection of children. That is, if you could have seven or did have seven, you were, uh, you were blessed in a, in a perfected way. Uh, not that if you had four, if you didn't have any, or you didn't have what we weren't blessed, but that was the that was the way that it was mentioned twice. I know in the Old Testament that that was a special thing to have seven. And uh, wow, <laughs> some of us think we're blessed if we didn't have seven. <laughs> but then again, 
Uh, but, you know, it's funny how that, uh, you know, God always illustrates his truth by the truth he's already written. The Bible's the best uh, illustrator of the Bible, the best interpreter of the Bible. So he goes on to say, she that hath born seven languisheth. She hath given up the ghost, her ghost. Her son is gone down while it was yet day. In other words, all of her happiness and joy is gone. She hath been ashamed and confounded. She's blown away. All of her children are gone. And re the residue of them will I deliver to the sword before their enemies, saith the Lord. Anything, anybody left, they're going to. Here's what Jeremiah said. Woe is me. My mother that has borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. Jeremiah is lamenting this. Said, I should have never been born. All I am is everybody in the whole world is mad at me. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard of kids that the whole world's mad at me? <laughs> Jeremiah said the same thing. Because see, they hated him. He preached to them the Lord's truth, and they hated what he had to say. They didn't want any part of it. They wanted him to say peace and prosperity. They wanted him to say something good's going to happen to you today. <laughs> That's what they wanted. And he didn't. He had to tell them the truth. And now he's going, look at this, Lord. Look what's happened to me. I did what you told me to do. Do people like me? They hate me. I read a notice about Philip Brooks said this. He said, to be a true minister to men is always to accept new happiness and new distress. Both of them forever deepening and entering into a closer and more inseparable union with each other the more profound and spiritual the ministry becomes. And so what Brooks is saying is basically what is taught in the New Testament, that God takes the good and the bad to draw you closer to Him. And it's really good that you experience not always good. You need to experience bad in crisis times and trouble and difficulty because it drives you to be more in communion with Him. Uh, the Lord say that those that reign with me shall suffer with me. And then he goes on to say, the man who gives himself to other men can never be wholly a sad man, but no more can he be a man of unclouded gladness. So the preacher is not always supposed to be happy about life. When things go south or things are not responding or things are... He's, he can't pretend to be all's well. He, he's got to be upset, disappointed, sad. He has to have his blue Monday. That's just the way it is. Uh, I don't even, I enjoy blue Mondays. Makes you reflect and see where you're at with God. And so uh, Jeremiah's going, woe is me. He said, my mama, I should have never been born for my mama. We'll close with that in verse number uh, uh, 10 and see what he says. Woe is me, my mother, thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. And here's why he said, I have neither lent on usury. I've not loaned anybody any money out and charged them over interest. Nor men have lent to me on usury. I hadn't borrowed for anybody. Why are they... He likens everybody's disdain to people who, who charge people outrageous interest when they loan it to them or they borrow and won't pay. And he says that's the thing that makes people mad at other people, money. And we know how that goes. Uh, you want some people to fall out? You know a lot of these shootings that go on around our community? You know what it is? Somebody got a product from somebody else and they didn't pay. Or they cheated the person of the product trying to sell them something that it wasn't. And so they ripped them off. Money and the, and the, uh, the, the deceit of money and business 
tends to make enemies. And Jeremiah said, I don't know why everybody hates me. I haven't borrowed any money. I haven't even lent nobody any money. You see the humanity in this guy? I mean, he's just a man. But God used him to where 2,500 years later, we're still talking about the weeping prophet Jeremiah. People still call their kids by the name Jeremiah. And I, so it's amazing. You say, oh, that, that, yeah, how else did that happen? It, it, nobody's calling their kid Nero. I've never met a Nero in my life. So, uh, you know, you don't hardly ever hear anybody call their kid Napoleon. And if they do, they get beat up at school all day. So, you know. All right, appreciate you. Let's bow our heads tonight. Lord, we pray tonight as we go, you'd protect us. We ask you to be with those that are sick that we've named here tonight and help us, Lord, as we make our way through this life. In Jesus' name, amen.